You can hear the bell. It's calling us to church. We're glad you're joining us here. Sharing the United Methodist Church, I'm Pastor Pete Harris. We're out underneath the uh, walnut trees. This, we're kind of thinking about how the wind's blowing, and so if you see uh, me scrambling, it might be ducking from a walnut. Just saying. Stay tuned. I keep your attention through the whole broadcast. Eh? We're glad you're here. We're glad uh, there's a number of folks here joining us in worship. This is the day the Lord has made. He invites us to rejoice and to be glad in Him. So that's what we want to do today. Got a question for you. When you go to a banquet, when you go to a wedding reception, the hardest thing is when you first walk in the banquet room, right? because there's that little table and you get your name card. And so you know that there's a place for you. You just have to go around and figure out, where am I sitting? What table did I get? Oh look, lucky number 13. We're gonna talk about that. You've got a place at God's table. It's a very important place. We wanna talk about that, so stay tuned. Hey, if you haven't been over to our website, www.sharonumchurch, uh, dot org. If you go there right now, you can leave us a prayer request. We'd love to hear from you. Immediately following worship today, our intercessory prayer team will meet and we'll lift up all the prayers of the people. Those gathered here and you that are joining us uh, on this live Facebook feed. There's also a place there to uh, learn more about the church. There's something there, a way for you to give if you would like to make an offering. We're thankful for all those who do. It enables uh, ministry to continue, even through uh, and now into this 23rd week of COVID-19. So we're glad you're here, and we welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I invite everybody to uh, take out your bulletin. Our call to worship comes to us. It's from Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord most high, the great King over all the earth. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to the Lord a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on His holy throne. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. I invite you to join with me in a time of prayer. Merciful God, we boldly pray to you on this day, confident that you'll not reject us. In fact, you want to be with us and you invite us into your presence. It is your love that continues to draw us together. Lord, we rejoice in your love. And we sing with you today. We sing praises, Lord, even if we can only do that within our hearts. We proclaim the good news of your grace, a grace we know in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Our scripture lesson for today is uh, from Ephesians, Paul's great letter to the Ephesus church, the second chapter, these words starting at uh, verse 4 down through verse 10. Because of his great love for us, God whose rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our sin, in our transgressions. See, it is by grace that you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. My brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, you know this. We used to we sing this all the time, but it's a responsive reading. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise, Praise God, God, all creatures here below. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. 
Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia. 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 That was a little weak. Come on. <laughs> Alleluia. Alleluia. That's better. Praise the Lord. The rain didn't chase us indoors. Yeah. <laughs> so in my last year of seminary, I was uh, I was given an honor. Uh, every every uh, February at Perkins School of Theology, there's a, a, a week set aside called Minister's Week. It, it's principally the uh, continuing education uh, experience for uh, the state of Texas and for all the Perkins uh, graduates come in and they give the week off from school. So uh, we all love that. It was a nice break in February. But... Uh, my last year, I was given the honor of, of I was, to pray the prayer of invocation. I guess that's what I was doing. I don't know. And uh, that's a big deal. There's keynote speaker. There's a few bishops. In fact, it was so important because uh, that after that event, I left with five business cards because I was being recruited by other. Uh, uh, they were from district superintendents across the United States that were asking me as a young pastor to come to their district. Um, I came to Michigan instead. But anyways, that's a different story. <laughs> so we got there. Uh, the honor came of giving the prayer also meant that uh, my wonderful wife could join me. And uh, we got there about a half an hour before the event started so we could get the lay of the room. And uh, our host showed us and said, here's where you're going to sit. And Jan turned to me and said, it's the front table. I said, not only is it the front table, it's up on the stage. Two things that were really important about that. One is that there was a skirt all around the front of the uh, table so nobody could see the second important thing, my knees doing this. Because <laughs> it was a big deal. And it was an important moment in my life to be able to uh, to do that. Uh, it's true, right, that, that seating positions matter. And I really, don't worry, they're all taped in today. Uh, I really learned this when uh, we tried to seat 300 people for our daughter's wedding at the reception. Who sits where? What table does the bride's family sit at? And the groom's family. And they only had four, so now who do we sit with the groom? And where does the preacher go? <coughs> I don't know if you ever had that issue. Where you sit, it matters. There's protocol. There's it's important. And so you can uh, you can offend somebody by not <coughs> by sitting them, you know, at table 28 in the back of the room. When they really should be at table four. I won't say which uh, which of my family members I offended that way, but it might have happened. Uh, I was reading a uh, reading uh, in a book by Dr. Neil Anderson this week, and he 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 made this note. He said the most exasperating negotiations at the Paris peace talks for the Vietnam War, the most ex uh, exasperating negotiation turned out to be what was the shape of the table and who sat where. Because of his great mercy, because of his great love for us, God, rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ Jesus even, even when we were dead. It's by grace by grace we've been included into the story God's telling it's by grace that we've been saved and God raised us up with Christ and seated us in the heavenly realms in Christ in Christ Jesus uh, Eugene Peterson in, in his translation of the message says immense in mercy and with an incredible love God embraced us he took our sin dead lives and made us alive in Christ then he, uh, he did this on his own with no help from us. And then he picked us up and he set us down in highest heaven 
in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the honor of being seated with Christ Jesus at that heavenly banquet table? The riches of his grapes are incomparable. <laughs> Nothing, nothing could be more true of, of God, it's been said. Uh, nothing could be truer about the, the character of God than uh, how, he, how he lifts up his countenance, how he looks upon us, that God loves us, and that God shows mercy. Now the problem, the problem is that, that either, either we take love, God's love uh, for granted and it has no impact on our lives whatsoever, or, or maybe even worse, we reject that God in fact could love someone like me, someone like you. But how could God love me given my past, given the things that, that I've done? How could God love me because I'm a sinner? to use the old language. How could God love us? Because who are we? Insignificant. The good news, the good news is found is that God knows. God knows exactly who you are. He knows how bad things are and how bad things could be. And God, and God changes them. And the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit's the one who comes and, and conveys this love of God to us as, as we open up our lives to hear, to believe the gospel message. Opening ourselves to the gospel. It, 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 means, it means being engaged by God. It means engaging with God. It means participating with Christ. See, this is the work, work of God's grace that engages with each one of us, the working of faith within us as we engage with God. That's what's going on. That's what Paul's trying to drive at in, in part. We haven't done it in a while in worship, but you know the Apostles' Creed, right? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried, and he descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, life everlasting. He ascended into heaven and is seated at God's right hand. This is the language of authority. That at God's throne, the right side is the center of authority and power. And it's from there that Christ <laughs> rules, that he's Lord of Lords, King of Kings as authority over all the universe. That power was given to him upon his ascension, right? And, and with our lives, with our lives, Paul's talking about to the church in Ephesus, with our lives caught up in Christ Jesus, engaged through the Holy Spirit into the reality of, of God's mercy and grace, it means that we too, we too have that authority. Think about that for a minute. We have that kind of authority. The significance, the significance can't be overstated. Neil Anderson, this, this Christian psychologist, says that a lot of people don't live in freedom, don't have freedom in their lives, simply because they feel as, as somehow they've been caught between two equal powers. You know, maybe you've heard this, there, there's on one side there's a devil and on the other side there's an angel. And which one are you going to listen to? But that's not true. They're not equal powers. There's one Lord of Lords. There's one King of Kings. We're not some pawn that's caught between Satan and God. 
and we, we listen this way and then we listen that way and whichever one we're listening to, we, we go off and we follow. No, that's not it at all. The one who's caught in the middle is Christ Jesus. He was caught in the middle when he was hanging on the cross. It's through his resurrection and through his ascension that Christ has defeated all power. They're all under his feet. But that's where the authority comes from. The power of Satan is broken forever. And in fact, death, as St. Paul will write elsewhere, death is the last great enemy of God. And that has been defeated in the resurrection. And so it is that Christ, Christ is exalted. Christ is sitting in the position of authority and of power. And are being, are being raised up in Christ. To sit in the heavenly realms, as Paul was saying. It's saying that, that Jesus is victorious and that his victory, his victory determines who we really are. Remember, this is the third of a three part sermon a series on who we are in Christ Jesus. Who we are is determined not by our good works, not because of what voice we're listening to, not at all. Our identities determined by God because we've been lifted up we've been raised up our life is found in Christ Jesus and so it's his power his authority that gives us our identity allows us to be in operation allows us to uh, work and stop blowing my sermon faster than I can read it There's a Christian teacher recently I've come across. Her name is uh, Heather Holman. She says many of us, many of us live in a prison of self-absorption. We're shackled, shackled with pride and shackled with despair. We compare ourselves to others constantly in our frantic and in, in our unending pursuit of perfection. We're shackled by our pride, shackled in a prison of self-absorption because we're constantly comparing ourselves to someone else. She writes, seated with Christ means we walk out of the never-ending cycle of comparing our lives to someone or something else. We leap free from cycles of shame and guilt. We're set free from that nonsense. She writes, Securely seated people can ask themselves hard questions about their lives. They can deal with their sin. They can grieve their losses. They can move forward in hope from a position of, of security and self-forgetfulness. They can joyfully do the good works prepared for them uniquely in Christ Jesus. Who am I? Who are you? Where, where do you, all believers, find their identity, find their esteem, find your purpose? It's found in Christ Jesus. And so this passage that I read from, from Ephesians 2, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't offer us any instructions as to what we should do. It states, ra rather, it states what has God done in Christ Jesus. Mired in that old stagnant life of sin, gratifying the, the cravings of our sinful nature, destined for the objects of wrath and judgment. God, God, because of his great love for you, rich in mercy, God embraced you. God took the old and the, the stagnant life and brought you alive in Christ Jesus. And then he picked you up and he sat you down at the table of his grace, right next to Christ Jesus himself. Why? So that God might show the incomparable riches of his grace, showering you with kindness in Christ Jesus. It would have been perfect if it started raining. I'm just saying right there. <laughs> showering you. So if we've been showered, this incomparable riches of his grace how does that i mean paul's not telling us what to do he's just telling us what god has done 
So how does that impact our lives? What does that look like? How do we, how do we, how does the world see that at work in us? I like this guy said, the best way, the best way to show the incomparable riches of, Christ, of God's mercy is through your testimony. Some of you are old enough to remember when the church talked about testimony. But some of us younger people get scared by that. What? I got a testimony, I gotta get up. I don't know if, if you ever went to church camp or sang at the tabernacle. Somebody, and usually it was three, were picked out and you walked up and you had seven minutes to give your testimony. They never picked me because I can't do anything in seven minutes. But. <laughs> testimony what's a testimony it's a it's a we can think of it in in law terms it's a it's an oath you, you take an oath and and you you promise to uh, to tell to declare the thing you saw is really true right it also means it also means giving an open uh, acknowledgement of what really is going on and it's in that sense. It means giving an account. You have a testimony. It means giving an account of what God's doing. Of what God, what you see God doing. God doing in your life. God doing in your family. In your neighborhood. In your community. In the world. We point to it. We say, let me tell you what God's doing. In the DRC, Brother Chorus got a well right now. Because, yeah, it's a great thing. There's a village that has clean water for the first time. The village uh, chief, the head of that village says, Jesus brought water to my village. Yes. Amen. That's what God's working, his incomparable riches of his grace through you, through you too, friend. God's at work. He's at work. You've got a testimony to tell somebody. Let me tell you what God's doing. And so this faith, this is how faith gets animated. This is how faith gets built up in us because we have a testimony. We start telling somebody. Maybe the first person we need to tell is ourselves. This is what God's doing. But this faith, this faith that Paul speaks of in these verses is a faith, it's a faith that's, that's built off of relationship. The gift of God's grace begins, uh, brings us into a new relationship. It's new in our relationship with God, but it's also new in our way that we relate to the world and the way, in fact, we relate to other people. So let me ask, I'm going to look in the camera because all these other people are getting nervous. So when was the last time you gave a testimony? When was the last time that, that you really thought, I wonder what I never sat down and, and wrote out a couple, three sentences. What has God done for me lately? And what has God done for you that God didn't do for anybody else? I mean, come on. We can all say, oh, God gave me uh, food to eat. I saw somebody brought tomatoes and uh, zucchini squash. We're in the season of zucchini. Right? We all can say that. But what is it that God did for you and he didn't do it for anybody else? Can you name something? When was the last time that you actually told somebody? Actually told somebody, you know, I don't go about doing this very often, but you know, the other day I realized God's been working in my life and this is what God has done. Now, if you tell your best friend, that's not scary. Oh. You could come with me to Linda's and we could just randomly pick out some farmer sitting at a lunch table. And... Yeah, that might be a little more uh, engaging. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith. This isn't that something you did on you on your own, right? It's not by works. Paul says so, so nobody could go around saying, look at me, look at me. Look how great I am. No, that's not how it works at all. By faith. Let me tell you what God's been doing. Because God's been at work in my life. Good things are happening. Where God's workmanship is how he ends this. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. 
which God prepared in advance for us to do. The key is it's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play any major role at all. I like how Eugene Peterson says, if we played a major role, all we would do is go about bragging about ourselves. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. No, God does both the making and the saving. He creates each one of us by Christ Jesus to join with him in the work he has to do. The good work that he's prepared, he's gotten you ready to do work that we better be doing. That's what makes that whole story about the well in the DRC. Democratic Republic of Congo and that Luji, that village. Why is that so exciting? Why does that make us just so happy? It's because it's something that God has prepared us to do. He prepared it way back in 2006 when I first met Brother Cora. Who knew that it would lead to this moment? Who knew? God knew. What's the next thing that God's getting us ready to do? That's the question we want to start praying about as a church. Because we want to add to the testimony of what God's doing. We want to be able to tell our neighbor, our friend, our family, let me tell you what God's doing. It's something that's been prepared long ago, and now the fruit is coming forward. Think about that. When was the last time you gave a testimony? Maybe, maybe it'll be the first time. That guy does that all, every time. I don't like that car. I put rumble strips out here so we can all hear the car. Let me leave you with that, that challenge. I really want you to think about church. What is God doing in your life? And once you can identify that, He's only doing it in your life. Maybe unlike anybody else, then you have an opportunity to tell someone. Not because it's to make you look like a braggart. It's because it's to give a testimony to what God's doing. And that way, you honor God and you honor the faith that he's placed in you by his incomparable riches, the riches of grace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Indeed. We have a time we always set aside in responding to God's word through prayers. And like, I would just encourage you uh, watching online, even if this is not Sunday when you're watching this, uh, go to the website. Our prayer team uh, uh, stays connected all through the week and we, we uh, bring them before the Lord in, in both our private prayers and then as we gather each week. So thank you to that who has sent one forward. Uh, each week we publish a, a sheet. This is what our prayer team works with. If you've not ever seen that. Uh, this is a listing of people and situations that we know about that have been shared with us. We take it as a sacred privilege to go before the Lord in a time of prayer. We certainly want you to be part of that. If you have a, a need of God. We want you to be part of it. If God's calling you to this kind of ministry of prayer, uh, the team is, is open to adding. It's not a closed group by any means. And we'd love to talk to you, either myself or uh, Michelle, uh, who's our lay leader, would be happy to talk to you about that. Um, several that we're praying for uh, include uh, uh, Jan Harris, who's coming home Tuesday, and uh, which means I gotta start cleaning the house today. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> I got the dishes done last night, but there's probably a few more things yet to need attention. But uh, also on the more serious side, uh, we know uh, our nephew down in Texas, Neil, is uh, uh, having more surgery or he's in the hospital. They're looking to see what's going on. He's meeting with an oncologist again this week, and we'd ask prayers for him. Um, uh, Reno's uh, having uh, surgery this week, so we'll pray. And. Uh, there are others, many others we know who have been sick, uh, recovering, uh, those who are undergoing uh, trials and tribulations, as the scriptures would say, in a variety of ways. And 
So I invite you now to come with me into this time of prayer as we lift up our concerns before the Lord. Let us pray. Well, gracious Father, we do. We, uh, we do give thanks. Thanks for your amazing grace that you so freely lavish upon us. We thank you that that when we could do nothing to make ourselves or to save ourselves that you sent Jesus. You sent Jesus to save us, but you sent your spirit to make us, make us in his image. We thank you that our salvation didn't come to us as, as a reward for something good we did. No, rather in your mercy and your love, it came to us and we received it as a gift a gift found in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for that saving grace. We thank you that you've made us for yourself as your own possession, that you've created us to fulfill your eternal plan and purpose for us. We thank you for all the good works that you've prepared for us to walk in. We thank you especially for, for that project with the uh, well and the DRC and, and the enhancement of Brother Cora's uh, and the congregation there, their ministry as they, as they reach into their neighborhood. Lord, we thank you. We pray a blessing today upon the Luji United Methodist Church and upon the ministry of, of Pastor Cora. We thank you, Lord, that the work you gave to us, you prepared long ago. We just rejoice in that, Lord. We look forward. We look forward day after day for the other places we can be uh, your workmanship we can give that living testimony to your incomparable riches we thank you Lord that through the power of your Holy Spirit we can come into your presence we have authority over all of that which would would distract us from drawing close to you but the power of the evil one is broken in Christ Jesus and we have the authority to announce that to proclaim that in through the blood of Jesus that that the devil is defeated. And so, Lord, we would pray for, for those who are in difficult place, who have been compromised in their mind or in their spirit, held bondage by self-absorption, that the name of Jesus, they would be set free. They would hear the truth of the gospel of how much you love them and how you your mercy is poured out on them. Lord, for those who are, are dealing with pain, those who are dealing with disease, those with uh, facing surgery, Lord, we would pray your compassion and mercy to be with each one. Lord, come and bring your peace. Bring the gift, gift of your mercy to each. Lord, that they would draw near to you in their hour of need. We continue to pray for our brother Paul in prison and for the others, Lord, on our list. We lift them up to you. And even now, Lord, within the stillness of our heart, we lay before you the needs of our family, the needs of our friends, our own personal need as well as the need of our community and of our world. Lord, hear our prayer. We're bold to make these requests as your children, Lord, because when, when we ask Jesus, how should we pray? He taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. There's an offering plate right over there for those who are present. And that's another way that we respond to the word of God. So we give of ourselves in a variety of ways. But our money is one. Again, I just, for those online, there's a place on the website, www.sharonumchurch.org. You can give that way too. It'll be a big help in these days. We're so grateful you joined with us electronically in this means. We're thankful for uh, the church gathered here. 
God's doing some great things in these days. They're difficult days, but God's busy at work. You're the workmanship. You're the one that God has. Uh, he's going to work through you. He's going to add to your testimony. We're thankful for Starting tomorrow, we have a new Bible study coming on 1 Corinthians. If you'd like more information about that, check out the website. We'd love you. 7 o'clock every Monday evening. We'd love you to be a part of that. You can join us here at the church or you can zoom in and be part of the class that way. We've got folks doing both and there's always room for more. We hope you'll uh, explore that opportunity as well. Receive now this benediction. May the love of God our Father and the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit work in you, giving you that testimony of God's mercy and grace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.